the teachings which we teach are the lost teachings of Jesus Christ. They have been suppressed for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, a conspiracy of orthodoxy upon earth has denied to those who have ears to hear, who have the flame within, the true mysteries and inner teachings of Jesus Christ. These teachings have come to light only recently in this century, and they portray a path of an inner walk with Christ, each man responsible unto that Christ. We are therefore engaged also in that warfare of Armageddon, whereby it is our mission to restore the lost teachings of Jesus Christ to those for whom they were given in the beginning, that they too might know the Lord and know that Lord, that mighty I am presence, which Jesus unveiled as their own true self. I would like to give to you now an understanding of this tradition of the inner mysteries by contrast to that which is taught in the Christian churches today so that you may understand where the line is drawn and truly accept literally the words of Jesus that to those who have not there is taken away that which they have but unto them who have there is added more and the abundance this means that to receive the inner Christ one must already have that light within now perhaps unbeknownst to you you and I have been accused of being neo-gnostics. Wouldn't you like to know what that is all about? <laughs> well, you know, neo means new, or kind of uh, latter day or Johnny come lately. Well, the word gnostic, which is spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C, this comes from the Greek word meaning gnosis which literally means knowledge. In the light of Gnostic teachings, Gnosis has been described as esoteric knowledge, the intuitive apprehension of spiritual truths or the knowledge of the divine mysteries, which is reserved for the elect, and that reservation is made by our Lord Jesus. Professor Hans Jonas is an authority on Gnosticism, and he writes in his book, The Gnostic Religion, that this knowledge is vastly different from the rational cognition of philosophy. On the one hand, it is closely bound up with revelationary experience, so that reception of the truth either through sacred and secret lore or through inner illumination replaces rational argument and theory. I think you can all identify this when your heart speaks with such strength that you know that its answer is greater than that of the reasoning mind. Those who have the developed heart chakra and who identify with a living Christ within follow the lead of the heart. But the heart must be purified first in order to be an adequate vessel of that Christ, so that what we feel in the heart is truly that Christ. Now the quest for the Holy Grail was a quest that was based on a path of initiation, whereby through overcoming, through championing the poor and the oppressed, slaying dragons, outsmarting witches and warlocks and so forth, the knights came to the place where their hearts were purified, strengthened, and one with the sacred heart of Jesus. And therefore, the finding of the grail was the finding of the purified vessel, the chalice that was now ready and fitting to receive him. This is the place where the heart becomes the seat of the mind of God and its intuitions 
and its own reason transcends the reason of the outer intellect or the mental body. Depending on where the individual is on the path of life, how he receives the seed of the sower will precondition how he will receive religion and what faith he will make his own. On the other hand, being concerned with the secrets of salvation, knowledge is not just theoretical information about certain things, but is itself charged with performing a function in the bringing about of salvation. Gnostic knowledge has an eminently practical aspect. The ultimate object of Gnosis is God. Its event in the soul transforms the knower himself by making him a partaker in the divine existence. For centuries, the word Gnosticism was used to describe the various religious sects that were labeled as Christian heretics in the second century AD by early church theologians. They claimed that the Gnostics were contaminating the true Christian faith with Greek philosophy. So therefore, already in the second century, there were a group of followers of Christ who pursued the inner knowledge of Christ by way of union with that Christ. And immediately, the orthodox tradition that had been established moved against them to deny the authenticity of their path. With further research in the field, scholars in the late 19th century began to define the term Gnostic more broadly. They said Gnosticism existed before and was even independent of Christianity. Some believed that it was a resurgence of Oriental religion, a religion in its own right invading the West as the rival and competitor of the Christian faith. What has puzzled scholars is that unlike other religious movements, no one has been able to identify a single source from which Gnosticism originated. Its ideas can be seen in Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, India, early Greece, as well as Jewish apocalyptic thought. Some have even referred to Gnosticism as a kind of international secret religion which was scattered all through the Near East in the years just before the Christian era. We also believe that the Jewish sect, the Essenes, that existed before the time of Jesus, followed a path of Gnosticism, and that indeed the rituals followed by Joseph and Mary and the parents of John the Baptist, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that they also followed the path of the Essenes. An astounding discovery made in the last 40 years has at last shed light on the Gnostics and their teachings. In 1945, an Arab peasant, Muhammad Ali al-Saman, accidentally discovered 13 papyrus books or codices in an earthenware jar near the town of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt. These leather-bound books were Coptic translations of 52 texts from the early Christian era that were made 1,500 years ago. Some of the texts were completely unknown before their discovery at Nag Hammadi. The original Greek texts from which they were copied are thought to date as far back as 120 to 150 AD, and one possibly to the second half of the first century. According to Irenaeus, G. 
Jesus Christ himself was still living in 50 AD. Unfortunately, some of the papyruses discovered by Muhammad Ali were thrown away or used by his mother to kindle the fire in the oven. Muhammad Ali, who with his brothers had killed their father's murderer a few weeks after he had discovered the texts, asked a priest to keep the books for him because he was afraid the police investigating the murder would search his house and find them. The texts were eventually sold on the black market in Cairo. Most of them were bought or confiscated by Egyptian officials and one was smuggled out of Egypt. A series of intrigues and personal rivalries over the acquisition and translation of the manuscripts followed. Not until 1977 was a complete English edition of this Nag Hammadi Library in a Jar published. The texts, which vary widely and represent different Gnostic schools of thought, include secret gospels, such as the Gospel of Thomas, which begins with the claim, these are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke and which the twin Judas Thomas wrote down. Now upon first reading that Thomas claims to be the twin of Jesus, we are dumbfounded because we have never been told that Jesus had a twin. But I believe that the word is used esoterically in the Gnostic tradition to mean that he was also the reflector of the Christ of Jesus, which is consistent with the teachings of Jesus that come from these texts, which I will unfold. Writings attributed to the disciples were among these texts, the Apocalypse of Peter, the secret book of James, and the letter of Peter to Philip. There were hermetic texts based on Egyptian lore, and there were texts with a philosophic and neoplatonic slant. There were poems, instructions for mystical practice, texts which give a radically different account of the origin of mankind than has come down to us as the traditional interpretation of Genesis. Based on his study of these texts, James Robinson, director of the Coptic Gnostic Library Project, says that the debate over whether Gnosticism was just a Christian movement is coming out in favor of understanding Gnosticism as a much broader phenomenon than early Christian heresy hunters would lead one to think. Now I am profoundly convinced that the teachings of the Ascended Masters have resurrected the true mysteries that were espoused by these so-called Gnostics. I am not convinced that all of the teachings espoused by the Gnostics, however, are consistent with the purity of Christ's teachings delivered to us today by the Ascended Masters. And so I think we have to use our Christ discrimination when we read these texts and go by the thread of contact and the understanding that we have. I do believe that many of us are reincarnated from this tradition, and there is a long history of persecution these 2,000 years of those who follow an inner path of mysteries to the realization of God. To this day, then, we are accused of being heretics and now neo-Gnostics. I think you will begin to understand why as I unfold. Gnosticism seems not to have been, in its essence, just an alternative form of Christianity, Robinson says. Rather, it was a radical trend of release from the dominion of evil or of inner transcendence that swept through late antiquity and emerged within Christianity, Judaism, Neoplatonism, the mystery religions, and the like. As a new religion, it was syncretistic, 
drawing upon various religious heritages, but it was held together by a very decided stance, which is where the unity amid the wide diversity is to be sought. One reason why the Nag Hammadi discovery is so important is that it has provided us with original documents of the Gnostics themselves, rather than what we hear about them from those who have denounced them. As you can see from today's newspapers, if all that survived of this movement were the newspaper articles, future generations would have little understanding of what we truly believed. It is our own texts as well as our own words which say what we believe, but most of all, it is our example and our life. So Gnosticism has suffered condemnation and a trial without jury and without the presentation of the true facts until today in this decade, in this century. Among the opponents of the Gnostics were Irenaeus, church father and bishop of Lyon, Hippolytus, a teacher who lived around 230 AD and wrote his voluminous refutation of all heresies, quote, to expose and refute the wicked blasphemy of the heretics. And Epiphanes, bishop of Constantia in Cyprus about 375 AD. They labeled the Gnostics of their day as dangerous heretics and tried to present them in the worst possible light, thus paraphrasing, distorting, or quoting their words out of context. Irenaeus, who wrote his diatribe against heresies about 180 AD, accused the Gnostics of fraud. Such texts as those discovered at Nag Hammadi, writes scholar Elaine Pagels, proved according to Irenaeus that the heretics were trying to pass off as apostolic what they themselves had invented. He declares that the followers of the Gnostic teacher, Valentinius, being utterly reckless, put forth their own compositions while boasting that they have more gospels than there really are. They really have no gospel which is not full of blasphemy, for what they have published is totally unlike what has been handed down to us from the apostles. Tertullian, a Roman theologian and apologist who later left the church and founded his own sect, warns that the heretics and the philosophers both ask the same questions and urges believers to dismiss them all. He says, away with all attempts to produce a mixed Christianity of Stoic, Platonic, or dialectic composition. We want no curious disputation after possessing Christ Jesus, no inquiring after enjoying the gospel. With our faith, we desire no further belief. Epiphanius, writing of his encounter with one Gnostic sect in Egypt, says, that the merciful God saved him from the depravity of the women believers who not only told him of their customs, but also tried to seduce him. I read their books, he says, understood what they really intended and was not entrapped as they had been. Their literature left me unmoved and I promptly reported these people to the local bishops and found which of them were masquerading as members of the church. And so they were driven out of the city, about 80 of them, and it was cleansed of their rank, thorny growth. It is astounding to us that those who have begun to be awakened to the inner Christ for 2,000 years have been persecuted. It is astounding to us that before the publication of these Nag Hammadi texts, the Ascended Masters released through our messengership the real path of the inner walk with God, the real understanding of the I Am Presence and the Holy Christ Self, and how we do achieve a oneness with our Lord. It is an astounding statement, I think, for the power of the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance all things which Jesus taught us 
as Jesus promised he would, without even having so much a scrap of information to go by, but only the memory of the heart quickened by the Holy Ghost. You have had that quickening, many of you, without either the Dead Sea Scrolls or these books from the Ascended Master's teachings. And by the inner beacon of the heart, you have arrived at that point of unity with the same movement of that revolution in higher consciousness, begun, yes, 2,000 years ago, but begun in the beginning as the original word of God that accompanied us when we took form. Our forgetfulness of this path has necessitated then our receiving it again, our becoming its fullness, our taking a stand for its message, and the recognition that there are those committed who have raised themselves up in orthodoxy as the standard of Christ's message, who are determined that no one will come to the realization that Christ in him is truly the hope of glory, as Paul the Apostle wrote. This then is a very entrenched battle. We see this at the root of kidnappings, deprogrammings, the anti-cult movement, the newspaper articles. They do not want anyone to know the real living message of Jesus Christ today. This is why we are gathered in a conference, an international conference for spiritual freedom, because first and foremost, we must have the spiritual freedom to worship the God that we know and that we know from within. In her book, The Gnostic Gospels, which I encourage you to read, Elaine Pagels poses some crucial questions about Christianity in the light of the Nag Hammadi texts. She asks, why were these texts buried and why have they remained virtually unknown for nearly 2,000 years? Their suppression as banned documents and their burial on the cliff at Nag Hammadi were both part of a struggle critical for the formation of early Christianity. Contemporary Christianity, diverse and complex as we find it, actually may show more unanimity than the Christian churches of the first and second centuries. For nearly all Christians since that time, Catholics, Protestants, or Orthodox, have shared three basic premises. First, they accept the canon of the New Testament. Second, they confess the apostolic creed and third, they affirm specific forms of church institution. But every one of these, the canon of scripture, the creed, and the institutional structure, emerged in its present form only toward the end of the second century, about 180 AD. Before that time, as Irenaeus and others attest, numerous gospels circulated among various Christian groups ranging from those of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to such writings as the Gospel of Thomas, of Philip, and of Truth, as well as many other secret teachings, myths, and poems attributed to Jesus or his disciples. Some of these were apparently discovered at Nag Hammadi. Many others are lost to us. Pagels continues, those who identified themselves as Christians entertained many and radically differing religious beliefs and practices. And the communities scattered throughout the known world organized themselves in ways that differed widely from one group to another. Yet by AD 200, the situation had changed. Christianity had become an institution headed by a three-rank hierarchy of bishops, priests, and deacons who understood themselves to be the guardians of the only true faith. The majority of churches among which the Church of Rome took a leading role rejected all other viewpoints as heresy. This is the denial of the four sacred freedoms and the fifth, the direct 
master disciple relationship with no intermediary so you see what our founding fathers fought for under the direction and inspiration of the holy spirit was that foundation of our pyramid of life freedom of religion of speech of the press and of assembly so that we would be able to defend our right to go directly to god through the living christ without this supposed hierarchy this tyranny this dictatorship in religion they overthrew the tyranny of england and now we must overthrow the tyranny of orthodoxy Today we see in America a frenzy and a fear of the loss of this power which is transmitted from the prelates and the hierarchs and the false pastors to the rank and file of the people who themselves have been so brainwashed to believe that there is only one true faith of this outer ritual that they themselves must be delivered by the true shepherds from this centuries old indoctrination. It is a vicious indoctrination that convinces generations and generations of people that they need only come to the altar and confess Jesus Christ and they will go to heaven. Yet this is what orthodoxy has done. They have deprived the individual of the inner walk with Jesus. This is the very core and crux of evil that must go down and this is why we live we have come again to defeat it so that never more there can exist upon this planet a world dictatorship of a world council of churches and keepers of the flame and revolutionaries of East and West who have come out of these religious forms. I promise you that I am here to arm you with knowledge to win in this revolution. And that knowledge is gnosis gnosis from the Lord Pagels continues deploring the diversity of the earlier movement Bishop Irenaeus and his followers insisted that there could be only one church and outside of that church he declared there is no salvation. Members of this church alone are orthodox. Orthodox comes from the root word meaning straight thinking, straight jacket thinking. <laughs> orthodox Christians. He claimed this church must be Catholic.